As you guys know, if you've been following with us the past couple of weeks into the new year, we've been looking at a series. I got to get this baby to come on, baby. There we go. We've been looking at a series on that what we've been doing is we've been trying to lay out the direction of where we're going in 2023. And pretty much the way I laid it out was our mission and our vision. I don't know if you caught that or not. But, but we laid out there that the direction where we're headed is reaching disconnected people and helping them become disciples of Jesus who then make other disciples of Jesus. Disconnected to disciple. We want to make disciples of all the nations like Jesus says in Matthew 28. And then what we did is we unpacked how we're going to get there. And how we're going to get there, remember the little, the last week, the little target, you know, that's kind of where we're going. How we're going to get there, the tire with the two sides to it is primarily by gathering together around God's word and prayer. So what, what relationships is going to be massive in this? I mean, the whole point of gathering is relationships. Right? So we're going to gather together around the word and prayer, and we're going to abide in Jesus. We're going to, we're going to stay connected to the vine, because apart from the vine, we're not, we're not going to bear any fruit. We're not going to be anything. So we're going to gather around the word and prayer daily in our own home, weekly in God's home, and bi-weekly or twice a month in a, in a friend's home. We're going to see our small groups as an intricate part of abiding in Christ. And then we're not going to just gather, we're also going to go where we live, work, worship, and play. And what we're going to do, in, in our going, we're going to primarily be thinking about disconnected to disciple. And how can we build relationships with people, authentic relationships with people, and help move them into a discipling relationship with Jesus, who then they go and make even more disciples. That's... That's what we laid out the past three weeks as our direction of where we're going and the little tire thing of how we're going to get there. What I want to now spend some time on, and I've been been praying about this and thinking about this series we're kicking off today for a couple months. And I didn't know exactly where to place it, but we've placed it right after our kind of direction series. And the idea now is that this series on prayer is going to be like, it's going to be like a plow. See, I see prayer as the thing that's going to push us in the direction of where we're going. And so the, the plow is going to be pushing us in the direction of disconnected to disciple, gathering and going. But it's interesting how... What's the power of that? What's, the, what's going to be the engine of that? Well, it's going to be prayer. And it, today, the, the text I'm going to unpack for us is from Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 12-ish. So if you have your Bible, you can start looking at that. We're going to go read that. And then that's the sermon t- for today. That's the message. As we kick off this series on prayer, I'm going to use today as kind of this linchpin that connects our series direction, which is mission. We're going to disconnect people and help them become disciples who make disciples. And we're going to see how prayer is an intricate part that's pushing us in that direction. And the need for prayer in that. Now, this isn't going to be the only thing about prayer we talk about. We're going to be dabbling with some prayer and fasting conversations, which is maybe something you've never talked about. I'm kind of learning a lot more about fasting, and that's going to be part of this series. We're going to be learning some different ways in which, uh, uh, maybe different ways in which you can pray, some helps for those of you that are like, I don't, I don't know how to pray. Like, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what to do. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit. Maybe the power of prayer, corporate prayer. Some of these things are what we're going to be dabbling with over the next couple. But today I see as a linchpin, and, and, and what I don't want you to miss is that this series is not disjointed from our last series, Direction. It's intricately connected. And I'm going to show you that today in our reading. So Luke chapter 10. Let me read this, let me pray, and then we'll get in. Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him 
two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly. That Greek word there can almost be translated as beg. Pray earnestly, beg to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This morning in our 920 time when we circled everybody up that was still here, there was a testimony somebody shared that there was prayer over and, and a healing that was brought to somebody this past week. How cool is that? But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. There's so much in here. We could be preaching a series just on this. So I'm going to try to tackle this as best as I can, but let's just go to the Lord in prayer, if that's okay. Let me just pray for us, and then I'm going to kind of try to unpack this. So Lord, even now, we just come to you in prayer. Lord, I ask you that you'd help me. Please help me now to, to, to share what needs to be said this morning. And I pray that, that as that sharing happens, Lord, that your spirit would come, that your spirit would blow over this place. God, without your spirit working in our hearts and in our lives, it's just gonna fall on, on it's just gonna fall. The, the words will fall to the ground. So I pray that you would help me like you helped Samuel when that word was brought to him that none of his words fell to the ground. Oh God, please come and do that work now. Let these words not fall to the ground, but let them enter into our hearts and into our lives and let it shape us and mold our very souls. God, I pray that you would be, yeah, just open us up to that uh, and hear only what you have for us. Not a word more than that, not a word less than that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This, today, what I want to do is I want to get us thinking about corporate prayer a little bit. I want us to think about praying together towards the direction of, of, of kind of where we're going. And so I, I have a list here, and I'm going to just throw this list up here. And if you would, I'd encourage you to take out your phone and grab a picture of this, if you wouldn't mind. Grab a picture of this. I'm just getting, I'm going real practical here, right off the bat. I'm just going boom, right into the practical. Um, would you begin to pray for some of these things? Um, some of these things, uh, another church plant, planter situation. We're hoping that that can happen this next year. We see a need for planting more churches in this area. Would you pray for that? Would you begin to pray for that? Uh, for the Plum Grove efforts and what Pastor Nelson is trying to do, would you begin to pray for that? Um, would you begin to pray for new leaders to emerge for our small groups so that we can be creating new communities of, of care and love and discipleship to be happening? Would you be praying for that? Would you pray for disconnected people in our lives? Would you really begin to pray over specific names of people who are disconnected from Jesus or disconnected from the local church? And would you pray for more disciples who would be, who'd make actually more disciples? And actually, that's going to be a lot of my message today. Would you pray for that? Um, I want to ask our church to begin to pray together in a kind of same direction. This isn't to take you away from praying for your grandkids, and this isn't to take you away from praying for healing and all the st other stuff that we pray for. I'm just asking us to begin, and I'm doing it right at the front of the, uh, of the series. Let's start praying in a specific direction, kind of together as a church family. And these are some of the things I'm, I'm asking. Would you start to pray for some of this stuff? That's all I'm asking. 
Okay? So would you do this? Because, and now let me unpack a little bit here. Jesus, after this, the Lord appointed, this is in, in Luke chapter 10, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We've got to talk about that for a second. We just got to sit, and, uh, sit on that. And there's so much, we can already talk about the two by two. We can, there's so much we can talk about. I want to talk about the harvest. Man, I don't know if you guys ever grew up in a, a community where the, there was harvesting taking place. Anybody ever make hay before? You ever make hay? Holy cow. Listen, harvest time is hard. Harvest time, see, when, when, the, when the guy's out in the spring tilling the soil and stuff, that's when he's got his big John Deere, and he's got the, the, the tiller, and he's just cruising along, you know, and, and he's tilling the soil. But when harvest time comes, that's when he's grabbing the local high schoolers, those who are just going off before college. He's grabbing everybody because harvest time is hard. There's a lot of work to be done when you're harvesting. You understand that? Maybe you don't get that. Coming you know, from Houston or something, you don't get the whole harvest thing. But when you're talking hundreds of acres or thousands of acres of property or something, and you're talking about, okay, we got to go bale this hay or something, to go get that hay from the field up into the loft of the barn, I've done that. Some of the hardest work I've ever done in my life, it's hard work to harvest. And Jesus is saying right off the bat here in our text, he's looking at these 72 disciples. He's already in Luke here sent out 12. The 12 have already been sent out the chapter before. They've come back. Now he's sending out 72 disciples. And Jesus says the harvest is so plentiful. There's so much work to be done. There's so much work to be done in the harvest. There's a lot of work. In harvesting. And, and, and what Jesus is talking about is he's talking about people. He's talking about people, real people. And, 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 and when I think about the harvest opportunity here in this area, it's just staggering to me. I mean, I, honestly, I almost get overwhelmed. When I start driving around and I start putting on my, on my kind of like... Um, Remember when I preached a couple of weeks ago around the parish idea? When I put my parish kind of hat on and I think of the community as the people in which we're called to, I get overwhelmed because there's people just everywhere here. The harvest is so plentiful. When I put my spiritual eyes on and I just look and when I'm driving around 1314 or I go up 1485 or I go to Atasca Cedar I, and I just see communities going like gang gangbusters, I get overwhelmed, honestly. And I feel so behind. When I see, uh, uh, when I see, McDonald's going up here and there's another one going up two miles down the road and I see a, a Denny's going up here and it's the fifth one in the community and, 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 and when I see Dollar General is everywhere, oh my goodness, Dollar General's it would start to spook me. I'm like, I'll be driving down the road, I see a Dollar General, it spooks me. Like, oh my gosh, another one. And I'm serious. I feel so behind when I start thinking of church planting, when I think of disciple making. I just get overwhelmed because, I mean, you're not talking hundreds of people. You're not talking thousands of people. You're not even talking tens of thousands of people. You're talking hundreds of thousands of people that are right here. In the, the harvest is crazy plentiful, Jesus says. Like it's everywhere. Just look around. The harvest is all over the place. There are so many who need to hear about Jesus. There are so many who need to uh, go into deeper relationship with Jesus and with his church family. There are so many people who just need a friend. I was talking to a guy at Walmart yesterday that Jackie started up a conversation with. And the conversation went deeper. I'm not going to get into it right now, but conversation went deeper and I was able to actually talk to him a little bit and it just came out. He's got no friends. This guy's in his 60s. He's got no friends. He's got no people in his life. He's alone. He's been alone for decades. There's just, there's so, 
So many people who are in so desperate need of hearing about Jesus, growing about in Jesus, getting connected to a local church, getting connected to gospel-centered communities of faith. Maybe that's even just a small group in your home kind of thing. I'm not just saying Sunday morning stuff. I'm saying gospel-centered communities. There's such a desperate need for this. The harvest is so plentiful. And then Jesus says, but the workers are few. Now, we gotta, I gotta, we got to think on this a little bit because I, I want to make sure we don't miss something. I would probably argue, probably say, there's probably more Christians now than ever before in the world. So when Christians, when Christians get into this like mindset, that like this defeated mindset, I push on that a little bit. I want to push back against this defeated mindset. Oh, the world, man, there's more Christians now than ever before. They're all over the place. I mean, Africa's blowing up. China blowing up. And God is, his spirit is moving all over the world. This defeated mindset is kind of silly, right? We know how it ends. We know that Jesus does his thing. He comes, he rules, reigns. He's even now ruling and reigning. Nothing is scaring Jesus. Nothing is throwing him off his game. He knows exactly what's going on. So don't be, have this defeated mindset. And yet this term worker, those who are going to be workers in the harvest field, Jesus does make this connection that there's few. And there's, there's a gap between the amount that, of harvest and the workers that are few. And Jesus just says, he just calls that out. That's interesting to me. I don't know exactly how to think about that. Uh, but Jesus says it. There's a need for workers, that's for sure. <laughs> There's a need for workers in the field. There's a need for the high school kids to go, hey, we need you, you know, it's, it's harvest time. I need to get as many people as I possibly can to go harvest in the fields. And Jesus is saying, okay, the harvest is crazy plentiful, the workers are few. Then the question is, what do we do? And it's interesting what Jesus points our attention to. What does Jesus draw our attention to? Right there in the text. Reach, open your Bible. Take a look at it. He says, therefore, he says, the, he said to them, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Therefore, here's what I want you to do. What's he want us to do? Isn't this fascinating what he calls us to do? Therefore, pray earnestly. The Greek word there is like beg. It's Pray earnestly, beg God. For what? For workers. For workers. <clears throat> beg God for workers. Pray earnestly. God is always trying to help us to rely on him more. You think of like in 1 Corinthians when Paul says about the thorn that's in his flesh, which we don't fully know exactly what that is, but whatever that thorn in the flesh is, and he asks to be taken away and stuff, and Jesus says, no, no, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So Jesus is always drawing our attention to rely on him. He's always trying to get us to focus on him. And this isn't just in discipling people. This is in every single area of your life. He's always drawing you to look to him, to rely on him. So in your finances, what is Jesus going to be trying to do? To get you to rely on him. Well, that's if you're doing really poorly in your finances and, and, and you don't have any money. He wants you to rely on him. But if, if, if you're really stacked right now, <laughs> you know, it's It's raining. What does he want you to do? He wants you to rely on him and look to him. He's always getting us to look to him, right? And this is in your relationships with other people. What's he trying to do? He wants you to rely on him. And this is in, your, in, in, in every aspect of your life, your job. What's he trying to do? What's he, wants, he always wants you to do? He always wants us looking to him. 
This is actually two days ago in my, as I've been reading through the Psalms and stuff, I, I just spend time in the Psalms every day. Psalm 28 came up and I, I, thought, I thought of this. I don't even have it on the screen. I thought of it this morning. Oh my gosh, that's what I read last night, yesterday in my, in my reading of the Psalms. Psalm 28, the Lord is my strength. That's what stood out to me when I was sharing with my family uh, at the kitchen table the other day. The Lord is my strength. I'm probably, right now, Seth Kunze, I'm probably the strongest I'll ever be. I don't think I'll probably get any stronger. I'm probably the strongest I'll ever be. I could go do a lot of stuff, act, physically active. I got, you know, enough money in the bank. I could do stuff that I need to do. I can make stuff. I'm, God isn't saying rely on you, that stuff. He wants me to rely on his strength, him. Look to me, he's saying. All the time, look to me. That's what Jesus wants us to do, to look to him. He wants us to be relying on him. So when he says, the harvest is crazy, plentiful, but the workers are few, isn't it interesting that Jesus would say, pray. Wow, that's just cool. Hear that? That's cool. Yeah. The Lord of the harvest, you know, he can make it rain. He can make it rain. He's trying to get us to look to him on all sorts of different levels. When it comes to discipleship, when it comes to reaching this community, what does he want us to do? First thing he wants us to do is pray. Pray to the Lord. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. For what? More workers. Isn't that interesting? This is something, I'm, I'm going to get really practical here. I'm going to get really specific. Um, th this is just an ask. Uh, we're going to be in this series all the way through the month of February. And I want to get our church praying together in the same direction, praying for some of the stuff we talked about. But also, I want to draw our thought into maybe trying, this is just, this isn't like a command, but maybe trying to pray together at the same time. And so what I'm going to encourage us to maybe do is at 10.02 every day in the name of it, kind of connecting Matthew or uh, Luke chapter 10 verse 2. Oh, isn't that cool? Come on. Keep it coming. This kind of makes me want to take a nap. That's nice. Isn't that cool, kids? Isn't that cool? That's like my favorite. Yeah. I'm wondering if you guys would be willing to, on your phone, at 10.02 every day, have your alarm set to go off. The Harvest Partnership, which is the network of churches to plant churches, all of the pastors, that's what we do. We actually set our alarms uh, for 10.02 each day. Yeah, keep it, wow. It's coming. We set our alarms for 10.02 each day. And um, I don't on Sunday mornings, honestly. But six days a week, my alarm goes off at 10.02 and I know that I'm praying and typically I just actually say what Jesus says here. I don't like pray a super long prayer. Sometimes it's, you know, I'm in a meeting or something, it goes off, I feel it vibrate or something. I just, you know, sh turn it off and then I just say a little prayer like, Lord, send out workers into the harvest field. And I'll just pray this prayer. And I know I'm praying it with other pastors and leaders and other churches in our area that realize the harvest is crazy plentiful and the workers are few. So let's do what Jesus calls us to do, which is pray, rely on him, rely on his strength, do what he's asking us to do to pray for more workers. I mean, is that something you'd be willing to do? To pull out your phone, to, to set an alarm for 10.02 each day, six days a week, or if you want it to go off on Sunday morning, I don't care. And to just pray, Lord, we're gonna pray for harvest workers because the harvest is crazy. There's so much work to be done. I want us to get thinking about that as a church family. Would you join me in that?
setting your alarm, I mean, it's super easy. And all of a sudden, as a church, we all set our alarms for 10.02. And it's not like this magic thing happens or something, but we just, we're reminding each other, we're reminding ourselves that there's others who are praying the same thing. And we're doing it together corporately. Notice Jesus isn't talking to one guy in this text. He's using the Texas y'all. It's all plural. Y'all, I want you to be praying. Y'all are going to do this, right? And then Jesus throws us a curveball. This is my last point. Jesus throws us a curveball because he says the, the, the harvest is crazy plentiful. The workers are few. So I want you to pray. And so far we're tracking with it. And then what happens? See, this part you're not going to like. You've probably been fine with everything so far. The next part is that Jesus says, go. See, this is a little twist. Jesus throws us a curveball. You become the answer partly to the prayer. There's a part of this prayer that gets answered by you as Jesus sends you. He says, pray for workers. Oh, by the way, I'm sending you. Go. Go. You and I get sent. This is Isaiah. Lord, here am I. Send me. And what do we, how do we travel? I mean, again, we could unpack this text like crazy, but there's a couple points that stand out to me that I kind of tried to take. You know, as he said, you're going to go out, you're going to not talk to people on the road. What does that mean? Well, he's just saying, you know, I'm not going to have you waste time in just kind of like little pleasantries. I want you to, we're working, we're working, okay? That's all that's kind of saying. It's not saying you can't say necessarily higher. So it's just say we're working, and what are some of those main things that are coming up in this particular text? Well, he's saying, you're going to travel light. See, I think some of us are traveling loaded down. You're not traveling light. So I ask you something like, is this, okay, now I'm not coming after any particular person. I'm coming after myself here just as much as anybody. But if I say to Tina, hey, is this your forever home? And she's like, yeah, this is my forever home. You might be traveling heavy. Because Jesus might say to Tina, no, I'm doing something else in two years or four years or something. So we gotta be protecting our hearts and our minds that we're not traveling this road of life so heavy that we can't even do what Jesus might be calling us to do because we've got it already all set. You know, the next 22 decades are already planned out. Whose plans? You. Well, we got to be careful about that. Jesus is saying, I want you to travel light. I don't want you to have, you know, all the details of the text. We're going to travel light. Everything's going to be held with open hands. So if Jesus wants to put it in your hand, fine. If he wants to take it out of your hand, fine. We're not going to travel like this. We're going to travel light. Deep relationships are going to be formed. That's what I read from the text. You know, if you're going to a house and they give you their peace and they welcome you, stay there. Hang out with them. Table fellowship with those people. You're going to eat with them, you're going to sleep with them, you're going to be with them in their life. What, what does that interpret t- today? Well, it means we're going to be in deep relationship with people. So as the enemy is trying to get you to recluse away from community, especially godly community, our king is inviting us into a family. Not just nice little friend people, a family his family, his body. So the enemy is going to try to get us to recluse and step back and away and not, not let anybody know. And God is going to call us to stand up here like Tina did just a second ago and say something like, you know, I've been struggling with fear. You know, I've been struggling with this lately. That's some of my struggle. Now she opens up the door for community. 
Because now I know I can share and I can know that when we say come as we are, I actually mean it. It's not come as you are, but really actually everybody's doing pretty good. No, it's come as you are because if we got honest and open and shared and got relational, you see kind of what I'm saying? So deep relationships are going to be important. I was so proud of our core class. The other day our core class met, I was so proud of just how open everybody was. And there was like nothing off the table is how it felt. They were just sharing. I was like, this is cool. This is good. Our relationships are going to go deep because it's all, it's all, come on. Come and heal, Lord, the deep stuff of our heart. And what, what are they doing? They're sharing about the king. They're having spiritual conversations. Right? They're having spiritual conversations focused on the king. The kingdom is going to come. They're healing when, when they're called to heal, when they're called by Jesus to raise, put out their hand and to pray over people. They're going to do that and healings will happen. They're called to talk about the king. That's what we're called to do today. We're called to travel light. Called to be super relational with people. We're called to have spiritual conversations that are primarily about the kingdom. And the primary part of the kingdom is the king. That's what I get from this text. That's what jumps out to me. And it makes me want to pray earnestly, beg of God, send out workers into your harvest field. But then to not miss the point that as I pray that prayer, oh shoot, God is sending also me. You see that? Don't miss that. Uh, honestly, one, one inter- translation of this uh, not translation, one uh, commentary this past week I was reading was really pushing this text to just be like church leaders and stuff. It was fascinating. Don't miss, these are the 72 that get sent out. This isn't just the apostle church leader. This is the whole church. All of us are called and sent out. I just disagree with that commentary, that's all. What are we going to talk about? Man, we're going to talk about Jesus as our king who saved us, who loved us. We're going to be relational with people. We're going to travel light. We're going to live our life with an open hand, not holding on so tight to everything. We're just going to follow Jesus. Jesus, wherever you want me to go, I want to go. And we're going to lean into his strength. We're going to lean into his strength as we pray and then as we're sent. We're going to lean into his strength. The Lord is my strength. He is my shield. Next week, we're going to bring up how fasting can potentially be a help in this. I've given you a warning in case somebody freaks out about that. Jesus says, my disciples, you know, will fast. Uh, That's probably something that'll happen. So I'm excited about that because that's been just kind of I'm not going to bring like super authoritative thing next week necessarily. Just kind of more of a dabbling. Our leadership team, our senior leadership team right now and our team facilitators are praying. Called them into through February a time of prayer and fasting. We're praying 1002 prayer. We're praying for our church family. We're praying this stuff that we got up on the screen because we want to lean into the Lord's strength this next year. We're not going to lean into our little wisdom, our little minds, what we think. We're going to lean into Jesus and what he's got for us. And we're going to, we're going to do that because he's died for us. He saved us. He loves every single one of us. He loves every single disconnected person in this community more than we even do. And he, he asks us to join him in that. He wants to bless us as we participate with him in this incredible journey. And I think it starts with prayer. I actually think it starts with prayer. Pray to the Lord of the harvest for workers and go. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time as a church family to just talk about prayer. And um, yeah, just thank you for this time. Holy Spirit, come and, and 
wash over us, just like this rain coming down. It would almost be cool if we could just take the roof away for just a split second and just feel the full, just get blasted. That's what I pray your spirit would do, Lord, is just come and blast us with your presence and your work and your activity. I pray for strength for our church family this next week, God. As we pray, even as we just pray, that you'd give us the strength to take that step to do that. Maybe it's not at 1002. It's not like that's this magic thing. It's maybe a helpful way for us as a church to do that. But to at least be praying and and joining you in, in that. So I pray, God, that you would draw our attention to yourself. Keep drawing us closer to you. And as we draw closer to you, keep drawing us closer to each other, Lord. Keep drawing us closer to each other. I thank you, God. I thank you so much for every single person in this room. I thank you for every person who's watching online right now. Thank you for each person, God. How much you love them. How much you care about them. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.